Hi, I'm Jim McVitie of Stanford Nanofabrication Facility at Stanford University. In this series of four short presentations, I'm going to discuss the basics of dry or plasma etching and give some information to help you choose the right type of plasma etch tool and process for fabricating your nanostructures. So in this first lecture, I'm going to have the introduction of dry etching. Following lecture will be on the basic of plasma and the type of dry etching tools, dry etching mechanisms, and choosing a dry uh, etching process and tool. In this presentation, I'm going to cover first, what is dry etching? Second, where dry etching is used in fabrication? Third, X profile control and selectivity definitions? And finally, why use plasma for etching? So let's get started. In nanofabrication, etching is the process of removing regions of deposited films or substrates. Two of the other major processes used in nanofabrication, deposition, the process of laying down films, and lithography, the process of patterning the match usually films of full resist, will be covered in other units of this course. As I mentioned, here we are covering the important process of dry etching. Basically dry etching is vapor or gas-based etching. Etching come in as a gas and byproducts leave as a gas. So having a volatile byproduct is essential for dry etching. Down here I show a diagram of the basics of dry etching. So here we have a wafer. We have a, a reactant, in case fluorine, coming down the surface, etching, uh, reacting with the uh, surface, and uh, a byproduct, silicon uh, tetrafluoride, coming off. In this lecture, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to limit our discussion to plasma dry etching. In this case, the plasma uh, offers extra control not available by wet etching where we use liquids. So down in the diagram here, we have an extension. Rather than going out with fluorine, we start out with CF4, which is a very stable gas, and we use a plasma to break up the gas and generate ions, electrons, but also react to free fluorine that then does the, uh, the etching like I show, showed you before. Okay. Where is dry etching used in the fabrication? First, it's used in, for removal of, of blanket layers, such as, uh, well, we can use it for removing resist and their process or other things. Secondly, and most importantly, is for patterning. In patterning, we use a mask to block uh, the reaction to ions uh, so that we can duplicate a copy of the mask in the material uh, on the surface of our wafer. And we usually, the mask is often a full resist. So let's show a diagram of how this works. So here, uh, let's say I start out with a substrate with a uniform film. And I want to pattern that film on the top. And the way I get there, first, I put out a full resist layer and pattern it typically with uh, optical beams or, or, uh, or le electron beams. And then I expose it to my... Uh, plasma etching process that selectively removes the film and the exposed area, open the areas, and then I remove the full resist, so now I have my pattern film on my substrate. Okay, here I want to do some definitions for X profile control. So typically, profile, X profile is critical to the structure we want. By profile, I mean the, uh, the edge of the uh, uh, the film. So for nanostructures, I want a very, uh, I want to have a, a high fidelity uh, reproduction uh, of the film, in, uh, of the structure or pattern in my uh, mask layer in the underlying uh, structure. Whereas in other cases, I want to have some slope and maybe a little bit undercut, uh, typically because of step coverage issues. So here I show the case I'm going to find the anisotropic etching with completely vertical uh, etching and it completely uh, 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 replicates the match uh, uh, in the film. The second case 
is isotropic etching, and this is where we get where it's a pure chemical etching, where you have undercut equal to the de X depth. So if, if I go down uh, a nanometer thick, I go sideways a nanometer. And again, this can be, it can be very useful for some structures where we really have a, uh, a difficult time getting depth coverage. And lastly, I want to talk about the neal anisotropic or directional etching. I think this is a little probably more typical of a lot of things we're going to see, actually see. We have a little bit of undercut and we have some slope. And some, a lot of times we want to we do this intentionally because, like I say, step cover. When we have a film going over a sharp step, having some slope make a big, uh, improves our ability, uh, well, reduces the chance of having breakage of the film at the corners. Okay, let's have a definition of uh, X selectivity. Selectivity is the ratio of the X rate of the material to be removed divided by the material uh, to remain. And so let's say here is my, again, my diagram of the substrate, the film, the photoresist pattern. I've, uh, now I've shown some etching, so I've removed some of my photoresist and I'm etching the material. And what I, the reason I want selectivity is I don't want to lose the, uh, the mask material before I get all the way through the film I'm etching. The secondly, we're also, a uh, second selectivity is when I go all the way through the material and I, I hit the substrate material. And there the selectivity can also be very important, such as if I'm, I'm etching a gate over a gate oxide and a thin gate oxide, I have to stop immediately before going through that thin oxide. So therefore I want a very high selectivity through the material uh, removed to my uh, underlying uh, gate oxide. So, selective, so normally we want a high selectivity. We want to have a, a, a we want the, extra, uh, the rate of removal of my film to be much greater than the removal rate of my uh, uh, mass layer. So here's an example of the etching of polysilicon over a silicon dioxide layer. So this is a, a near anisotropic etch case. Here, here I have a, a, this, a top layer right here is the photoresist layer. Below that, I have the polysilicon layer that I'm patterning. And finally, I have the oxide, uh, uh, the silicon dioxide layer uh, uh, down below. And for this process, we have uh, a photoresist, well, no, no, polysilicon to photoresist selectivity of six, and a polysilicon oxide uh, selectivity uh, a ratio of 13. Uh, we, these numbers, these selectivity ratios can be from one to over a hundred, even up to a thousand, depending on the process and the details. Okay, now why use plasma for etching? A number of good reasons. First, we can use it for generating local sources. So like I say before, I showed etching of silicon with, uh, with free flooring. Well, free flooring, very reactive, and it's much easier and safer to generate the flooring locally using a plasma. Second, a plasma etching is often much easier to do than wet. A case in point is a case of polysilicon etching. Wet polysilicon etching is very difficult to do with a mask layer. Next, uh, we can get very high aspect ratios using plasma etching. Over here, I show you uh, a case. This is a so uh, aspect ratio is a ratio of the depth uh, div uh, divided by the width. So here I'm showing uh, an etch into silicon of uh, aspect ratio of 40 to 1. In plant action, we have ions, and the ions can be controlled, uh, can be used uh, to bombard the surface and, and can do a number of useful things. One, the ions can clean uh, the surface, remove oxide polymers left over from lithography before your acting process. They, uh, in addition, they can activate uh, chemical reactions. So we, uh, I'll show you how sometimes the chemistry of the radical will just sit on the surface and do nothing, and the ion can, can come in, break bonds, and allow the reaction to proceed. And uh, ions are nice in that we can control the ion energy and the directionality uh, 
by using uh, the geometry of the system and by having uh, uh, by judicious use of uh, RF power. Uh, ion energy and directionality are key to anisotropic etching. Higher energy means more directional ions, and that leads to more uh, anisotropic x profiles. In this diagram, I show uh, symbolically uh, uh, the etching process and role of ions. So here, on the top part here, I'm saying here I have an electron uh, 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 colliding with a, a source molecule uh, generating a free radical. This free radical then diffuses to the surface that I want to etch, it absorbs in the surface, and if it's like chlorine, it just sit there. But if we have an ion come in, the ion can actually create sites by breaking bonds, so let's say silicon bonds, and when the bonds are broken, the absorbed uh, action can then react with uh, the material, so let's say silicon, and then form uh, a volatile product or, or, or lead to a chain reaction of a spontaneous process, uh, reactions that form a volatile product and so the product then comes off and we're net removing the uh, let's say silicon we we'll move silicon from the surface here i saw some uh, example reaction here of chlorine so we have chlorine gas in uh going into the plasma electrons in the plasma breaking the uh, chlorine gas into uh two chlorine atoms uh then on the surface silicon plus an ion Plus the chlorine atoms uh, uh, yield silicon uh, dichloride. That comes off. We can either have dichloride or trichloride come off. And if you have the dichloride case, then it can react in the gas phase to form the more stable form of silicon uh, tetrachloride. Okay, summary. Uh, etching, a dry etching is a gas phase etching. Byproduct of volatility is essential. Plasma offer, plasmas offer lots of advantages over wet etching. Uh, and one of the big advantages is the flexibility of the egg profile. We have isotropic, anisotropic, uh, near, near anisotropic. And we have uh, local generation of reactant to radicals. And we have controlled ion bombardment. Uh, which can be used to uh, activate surfaces a in addition to cleaning, and they, uh, the ions have directionality. In the next video, I'll sh uh, talk about the basics of plasmas and the types of dry etching tools. Thank you.